Untold Stories is a conference started in 2019 by Startup Europe Networks and Startup Hungary. We believe founder stories are powerful, and we pride ourselves on having real, no BS conversations to inspire and educate our community. Building off of our offline events, we developed this podcast with TechCamp Global to bring you untold stories from the region's best founders year-round. In each episode, we try to uncover the details and hands-on tactics behind the founders' successes so you can skip their mistakes and benefit from their years of experience and lessons learned. Our hope is that you will be able to find new ways to accelerate your growth. Let's dive in. My name is Mary Alcantara, and this is the Untold Stories Podcast. Kinga Jentetic is the CEO and co-founder of Publish Drive, an easy-to-use software for publishers and authors to distribute and manage ebooks, print, and audiobooks under one roof. Founded in 2015, based out of the U.S. and Europe, publishers and authors have published over 100,000 ebooks with Publish Drive in over 400 online stores and 240,000 libraries in five continents. Publish Drive goes beyond distribution, streamlining the entire publishing process with innovative and exclusive tools in the book industry. Today, we're sitting down with Kinga to learn more about why she started Publish Drive, how she continues to innovate in the publishing industry, and talk about her journey as a female founder. So Kinga, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Mary. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. So um, let's start with the human side. So the first question we usually ask our founders is, what made you want to become an entrepreneur in the first place? Yeah, it's a really long story, I would say. So I try to make it short. <laughs> um, basically, I come from uh, a family where my mother was also an entrepreneur. So sh she actually had her own company and IT actually, so it's really, really good that today I can also say that basically I have a, a company which relates to tech and publishing. Um, and besides that, uh, I always had, you know, two major loves in my life. Uh, one of them was music and the other one was literature. And I just knew that at some point in my life, I want to work um, in the field where I can actually relate to these passions of, my, uh, of mine. And I was fortunate that I actually could uh, manage that um, because when I wanted to publish my master thesis, which was about music and how uh, music influences the image of a country. Um, I just uh, realized that it's a really good topic that might be interesting for others as well. And I basically uh, just researched the market and tried to publish it. And at that time, um, there were no really good solutions in order to publish in a wide um, area. So basically on all stores worldwide. Uh, I managed to do that um, to publish on Amazon only, uh, which was still really, you know, pain in the ass, the whole process, mm -hmm. because I have no technical background. Um, I've studied business and marketing, but I have no idea idea how to code and I think that's the best for everyone <laughs> and um, yeah people were buying my book so that was really interesting to see that there were readers from the US from um, you know Brazil Mexico and they ask questions as well uh, even today uh, sometimes I receive messages whether I still research the topic so um, at that point I just realized okay there is a good market for this because if my master thesis which was not professionally edited and you know I, I just knew that it's not something that um i could be the you know the most cutting edge one um then if it is selling then i'm sure that there is a lot of other people who can actually tell better stories in a much better way so that was basically the spark what we realized that okay there is a problem that uh a lot of creative people is actually facing with and there is no really good solution for that and uh, we just started to work on that with the co-founders from the university to make it happen and help other authors and also book publishers streamline the whole publishing process so that's the short story <laughs> so you didn't set out to become an entrepreneur but you found this unmet need in the market basically um that for something a pain that you experienced personally and decided hmm this is probably 
I'm not the only one who has this problem, so maybe I can do something about it. Yeah, so that was part of it. And the other part was basically that I could see that, yes, my mom was actually uh, an entrepreneur as well. And uh, she raised us in a way uh, with my sister uh, that she was managing her own business. And I could see that, yes, it's a lot of work. However, you can actually be really flexible and you can, um, you know, hire your own people. You can work with the team that you wanted to work with. And uh, yeah, that was really aspiring for me um, that I can actually be something like that as well at some point in my life and also you know when I was work, uh, at the university I uh, was working at Zurich Financial Services in Switzerland for instance and I just realized that okay a big company at this point in my life is not something that I want to uh, be part of um, because I just felt that there is so many you know cool things that we can do in terms of um, solving problems and yes that's actually a really uh, passion of ours so it's in the company's dna that whenever we see a problem we just want to solve it and we don't stop until we do it that's amazing yeah i love that so tell us so you said you know you got together with the co-founders mm -hmm. to build publish drive but you're not a coder so how did you find somebody who could code and tell us about yeah, yeah the at the university basically so uh, we went to the same university and uh, yeah whenever you just go out and you know get to know other people then you just realize that there are different kind of people who have different skill sets and that's something that um, is actually really cool within our team that uh, as I mentioned uh, I don't code so I have more on uh, more experience in the business side meanwhile uh, Robert uh, he is more into the data side of things and he can code but that's not his strength actually but uh, more like uh, how to see everything in systems and data analytics um, and Adam he is more on the coding side so it's really cool that everyone has different kind of skill set and we can work together because we uh, complement each other and the original founding team is still in the company today yes so, so you guys have run this together the whole mm -hmm. time and how many um how many people do you have now in published drive? only 20 yeah. so um you have yeah tell us a little bit more about published drive so mm -hmm. i guess the original concept was to help you know amateur self-publishers you mm -hmm. know get get their word out about their creative ideas and mm -hmm. put them on the market but i think it's evolved a lot beyond that yeah. too so tell us a little bit about, about kind of your journey and how you've yeah. developed yes yeah, so in the beginning we actually started uh, to work with um on so only ebooks at the beginning and also we because we come from hungary we actually started to work with a lot of book publishers as well so we went to all the big publishers here in hungary to realize uh okay what kind of problems they are facing with how we can help them whether this you know digital publishing is a thing uh, already or we need to educate them um how to do that and and what is uh why it's so good because there are still a few publishers today who are really traditional and they don't really see the point of digital publishing which is super weird but that's how it <laughs> works <laughs> and um yeah that's that was uh, the very early days um and um yes on the other side we also started to build the relationships with the different retailers um because we work with as you mentioned a lot of like major players like amazon apple google but also the smaller shops worldwide uh but to get to the uh, phase where the big guys are actually taking ourselves seriously taking us seriously um that was not easy so it was a really long journey to get to know the right people also to stalk them at different conferences you know and uh, just to make sure that they can actually see us and they can understand that okay we actually are you know uh, believing uh, um, planning to have a really good um, growth rate and we also show them numbers and when we actually can deliver on those promises that was something that actually um, sparked it and we could have the relationship uh, what we wanted from day one basically um, because we work with them on a higher level so that's really important in our business and uh, yes yeah, so in the beginning it was ebooks only um, and yeah today it's it's more like working on all aspects of the whole book publishing scene because we have two other additional formats as well uh, we work with uh, print on demand type Titles, which is basically a print version so whenever someone is actually coming um, on the site of the retailer for instance 
uh, they can see the books listed there um, and they can buy it. However, it will be printed uh, just at the moment when someone orders it. So it's really good for the whole um, logistical chain um, and also throughout the whole COVID area. It was one of the growth aspects as well because a lot of bookshops were closed down and there were not enough uh, books on stock. And they were, so it was a mess. <laughs> uh, and yes, we work with audiobooks as well. So um, I think everyone who is listening to a podcast <laughs> Uh, already knows why uh, any kind of content which is in audio is really important today um, and we can see that also um, when it comes to the book sales that audiobooks are rising as well and uh, yes in the beginning it was only in distribution so basically helping streamlining that part of the process um, which is still the core of our business today however we added um, basically all kind of uh, functionalities in the platform uh, that helps throughout the whole publishing journey. And that's where we want to grow in the future too. Uh, so we basically help already in uh, the formatting side uh, to create more content faster and in a cheaper way for our publishers and authors. Uh, and then um, we also have a lot of book marketing tools that we built. Um, and those are actually really helpful if um, the authors or the publishers want to actually uh, not just publish their books, but sell it as well, because we all know that it's not enough to publish a book. You really have to put yourself into the marketing um, side as well. And uh, yes, we developed a cool analytics features as well. So whenever there is about the sales numbers, you can dive in and you can analyze, okay, what what is the best selling country for you? Um, what is the best price there? How the whole you know um, catalog that you have is performing? Uh, which stores are the best for your business and so on? which is really helpful uh, to get real-time data as fast as possible, and you can modify your marketing if you need to. Um, and then we also added ad uh, additional functionalities on the royalty management, because uh, basically we deal with royalties. Um, mm -hmm. So whoever is actually signing up to our platform, um, they will be selling books, and then we will pay them what they actually sold and what they earned. Um, and uh, we had a lot of new authors and even book publishers come coming to our side and said that, yeah, hey guys, it's really good that, what, that you are taking care of the financial side of the business, but can you help us in royalty management as well? So can you help us uh, in a way if there are more co-authors um, in a book, for instance, and how they divide uh, the money at the end of the day? Uh, can you actually provide more reports on that to have more transparent royalty management? Because still today, uh, when it comes to uh, book publishing royalty management is pretty much a black box for many of the authors. Right. And, yeah. And they There's a lot of trust yeah. that goes into that, you know, books sold and how, yeah. How do you know you're getting what you deserve? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a much faster and more transparent uh, process for the authors as well. And for any, any other contributors. So it's really, uh, it can be an illustrator or designer or whatever. Um, but yeah, that was also an additional functionality that we've developed. And it's actually uh, so additional that we have a separate product for that so we already have it um, totally independent from uh, the distribution side of the business um, because we could just see that it's it's already living on its own as well so that's why we wanted to make it work for everyone who wants to join for that product only I'm, it seems like that could also be even used in other industries not just publishing right I mean like I'm sure music you know yeah. recording <laughs> you know the same same pain point exists there, right? So Yes. We actually, at one of the conferences I met, a uh, country manager at Spotify, and they just said that, yes, they know that kind of pain. Um, and it's it's really a big issue for the music industry as well. So, yeah, you never know what will happen with that. <laughs> Maybe your first big spinoff project, yeah, coming up. <laughs> or just additional, you know, um, market. Because what we can see that, especially that we opened up for uh, audio mm -hmm. books in general, we are already trying to get in touch with the players in the music industry. So uh, we will be selling on, on Spotify and on other channels that are actually coming from the music industry originally. But I, I'm sure that in the future, there will be more cross-section within the whole publishing and music industry. And by the way, um, I was working in the music industry before, and uh, I actually learned a lot how the whole digital uh, publishing is working from the music industry as a spec. So um, I think somehow book publishing is is trying to um, 
follow the journey of the music publishing and uh, avoid the mistakes where it basically happened in the music industry because there was a lot. That's why the digital publishing is much smaller in the music industry than in, in uh, book publishing um, because the book publishing is $150 billion worth. So it's a huge market and uh, digital publishing is, is getting almost 30, 40 or even 50% depending on the country. So it's, it's really a big, um, big proportion of the whole business. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it lets you combine your two passions again. So music and literature. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but yeah, cause so you said, so when did you launch? So you started with just eBooks, mm -hmm. but then when did you launch with the print on demand and, and audiobooks? Mm -hmm. Was that just during the pandemic or even earlier? Uh, so we've been working on that for a while already, but it was actually when we launched it publicly, it was in uh, just when the whole uh, pandemic outbreak happened. So uh, I think on the same day as uh, wow. the whole, you know, Hungary was closed down, So which was, by the way, my birthday as well. So <laughs> <laughs> it, was going a, on. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really weird day, to be honest, because we had one of the biggest uh, launches um, because that was a huge deal, even guys um, from Apple were reaching out to us that, hey guys, okay, that's really cool. Okay, let's talk how we can actually make business on all fronts. Um, so yeah, it was uh, one of the biggest launches. And yeah, it, from a communication perspective, it was um, not the easiest one because obviously we know that a lot was going on, as you mentioned. Um, but I think it was really valuable for our customers and they were super happy because everyone was freaked out and you know everyone was uh, just thinking about, okay, what will they do, whether it will be good for the business or not, uh, how they can sell more than, and if it is good for the business because more people are reading because they have to uh, find some kind of hobby at home uh, during the quarantine, then uh, how they can actually maximize this uh, in the fastest way. And we were really happy that we could provide them uh, with a solution that is actually helping them um, to have the same content, but in different formats and they can actually sell more. And even a lot of book publishers, um, you know, they reached out to us because a lot of bookshops were closed down during the whole COVID situation, unfortunately, and they lost many of much of their inc income. Um, and um, that's why they were reaching out to us, okay, what they can do, how they can do digital more strategically, how they can sell more and, and try to um, fill the gap what they lost in the whole physical bookstore uh, way yeah i'm sure you you probably saw it i mean it's you know we all know you know there's mm -hmm. been a huge huge uptick of kind of people trying new things you know okay i've always wanted to be a writer now i have yeah. time i've always wanted to start a podcast or you know so yeah. there's been just kind of a huge surge in digital content i yeah. think during this last few years and i think you guys were really well positioned to kind of capitalize on that and, and help people so it's really interesting what you're saying. So whether it's print or, you know, or written first or audio first, you can really help on both sides there. Yes. So is that how the product works? So you have the, the audio book, so you're, you're able to help kind of reformat an ebook or, you know, you can mm -hmm. make that. How does that work like on the technology so, side? Um, for the ebook side, currently what we have is um, to convert the manuscript into the right format, um, but also uh, to help on the print side. So make it um, basically adjustable for all the printers we work with um, and also to create the, uh, the PDF versions. Um, and then on the on the audiobook side, um, if it is from ebooks to audio, then uh, we have a few um, companies we work with who can actually help to create the audio side or audio book itself um, because audio is really about um, how you know the um, the recorders are actually performing and and the narrators whether they can do a good job so we believe to create really good um, content in that field uh, with human people as well uh, if the author itself cannot actually uh, perform because we work with a few uh, met not just a few, but a lot of <laughs> authors who are actually performing. They had their radio host before. They were radio host before or whatever. So they have the skill set to actually uh, record an audiobook, but not all of them are like that. So for them, we suggest to work with uh, one of our partners in creating the audiobook. And um, yes, because... Uh, yeah, there are some solutions with AI that you could do that. However, we could see that, um, first of all, the stores really 
don't like that. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, uh, the quality is not the same. So um, if you want to really sell um, good proportion of books and good sales, then you need to invest a bit into the audiobook side of the business. So yeah, that's how it works. But basically through Publish Drive, yes. you know, authors of eBooks, you, you, you offered them a streamlined way mm -hmm. to do that. Yes. So here's how much it costs. We can help you do it. Mm -hmm. We can set it up. You can record it yourself or we mm -hmm. have somebody who can help yes. you. And, and that wasn't it. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. And then do you have anybody from, you know, coming in yet or I guess maybe this is part of the plan on the audio side who mm -hmm. wants to then you know convert that to a print or, mm -hmm. or an ebook or does that's it that didn't really happen before to be honest because most of the people who we work with are coming from um the written so basically the the ebook or print side mm -hmm. um and yeah it's it works really interestingly because audiobooks many many of the authors are even selling their audiobook rights to publishers so it's a bit different how mm -hmm. it works at least from the uh, right copyright perspective uh, as far as we could see um, but there are more authors who are actually doing it on their own but most of them are coming from um, the ebook part uh, or from the print part um, and uh, yes they invest a lot so it's it's actually um, like three times more even or at, or even five times depending on the narrator's costs um, and then just creating an ebook or a print version. But then as there are less content in audiobook yet on the market than in ebook and print, uh, you can actually stand out easier and you can sell more. So that's uh, something that we could see. And uh, also, um, meanwhile, in ebooks and print, the traditional retail works really, really good in many cases. Um, when it comes to audio, uh, the subscription business is the best. So whenever um, there is a subscription platform where readers can access content for like Audible uh, or something. Yes, yeah, yeah. like Audible or even, uh, you know, Spotify or other platforms, then uh, you can actually get the mo most of the sales coming through these subscription businesses. Hmm. So, yeah, so you talked about, you know, the, on the product side. Mm -hmm. So you have ebooks, the print on a band and audio and then um, on the functionality side, I mm -hmm. think that's also really interesting. So you started with just a distribution. Yes. Um, and then how did you add on those other functionalities over mm -hmm. time? Yeah, it was basically coming from the customer needs. So um, we tried to build relationships with the, uh, with the clients we actually had in a way that we understand what they need to actually stay, as, stay with us longer and also to to be more uh, competitive on the market as well. Uh, so we added a lot of things uh, when it comes to help the sales uh, part. So we added um, functionalities in terms of book marketing, uh, but we also, as, as our main idea was behind Publish Drive to give a more transparent way of doing the whole book publishing area. We believed from day one to actually have uh, an analytic tool, analytics tool that helps understand what is going on and, and get as much real time data as possible from all the stores we work with. Um, and um, yeah, that was also really important for the book publishers, but also for the authors we work with. Then. Um, uh, well, we could see that there were some struggles in terms of, especially for authors uh, who don't really understand the whole market yet uh, because they are just newbies um, and they needed more time to educate themselves. So we added uh, functionalities, how to um, clean up your metadata, which is based, metadata is basically uh, any kind of information that is tied to your book. And that's what the retailers will actually uh, try to feed in their algorithm and show uh, based on that data, they will show your book to the right readers. Mm -hmm. And if it is not really uh, cleaned up or it's not really uh, targeted for the readers that you want to reach, then at the end of the day, you will have no sales. So um, we really wanted to help on that front um, to make sure that uh, the categorization of the books, for instance, is the best uh, for the content itself. And there are more than 5,000 categories you can select from. So if you are a newbie and you don't know those standard categorizations, what the industry is using, then you will get lost and you will just, you know, sit there and, and don't, know, don't know what to do. Um, so we built an AI tool, which is basically reading the books in the back end. And based on what he read, uh, he actually suggests uh, categories. Um, obviously, it's AI based, so mm -hmm. it's learning on, on the way. 
uh, but at least it helps the readers uh, or the authors to actually select, okay, whether it's something that would fit my book or not. And uh, we just try to uh, shorten the whole lear learning curve from them. Sounds like SEO. It's like a keyword planner for... Yeah, for, something similar yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that's basically part of the whole um, book publishing, um, you know, uh, functionality because it's it's really important to, to get to the right readers because without that, you will just get lost and you will have not enough sales. Um, and then, um, yes, on the ro royalty management part as well, it was like that at one of the main, uh, like, influences on the market. Um, they are actually a, a huge uh, publisher, but they also work with a lot of authors in a way that they have a big author group and so on. And we started to partner with them and um, in a way that we actually could understand, okay, what is needed on the market on a bigger scale? Also, what is something that they need? Um, and they were saying that, yes, this whole royalty management is just a huge pain point for uh, this kind of new wave of publishers so who want to change things and be more transparent. Um, and that's when we started to work with them together to create the beta version first um, for the uh, royalty management tool. Um, and today, yes, they are using basically all kind of features that we uh, came up with and uh, they are a big ambassadors for ours as well. So it's, it's really good that we could actually build a partnership uh, because we delivered what we promised again. So I think that's super important in our case that um, we always wanted to build the functionalities that is actually helping for uh, our users because obviously we know that there are some buzzwords that investors like right. uh, like you know AI and uh, blockchain and whatever <laughs> which is super cool I'm, I'm really a fan of them and we also have an AI tool by, by the way um, but uh, we also needed to be uh, really focused on on the authors and on the publishers what they need and in some cases it's just much simpler and uh, less technology heavy uh, um, however, we support that with technology, but at the end of the day, what the value is important for them is uh, important for us too. Yeah, um, we'll touch on this in a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. the human aspect. I think that's also something you guys do really well, just, you know, treating people like human beings and just reaching out and having that touch point, um, which I think is super valuable. But so, okay, you have quite a few different stakeholders. So there's publishers, there's authors, these yeah. different platforms. How do you keep everybody happy or how, how do you prioritize, you know, this huge kind of network that you have to maintain? Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, so, for instance, for the book publishers and for the retailers, which is more like, you know, um, coming from the traditional way of the publishing business. Um, for instance, we go to a lot of conferences, which is about uh, book publishing in general. Obviously, co throughout COVID, it was a bit different mm -hmm. because a lot of uh, conferences were actually um, canceled. Um, but we even um, tried to keep in touch with uh, all these uh, retailers and book publishers in a way that we could uh, set up Zoom calls and so on. So that was really good that everyone was open for that. So it's, it's uh, something that we could actually manage. And um, the other part is obviously the authors. Um, we actually have our own Facebook group. We try to um, help them to actually support them throughout the way. We have a really good support team in general uh, who is actually uh, taking care of all the issues. Um, and yes, we um, try to make them happy in a way that we ask their feedback and, and opinion all the time. So even when the whole COVID thing uh, happened, uh, we just understood, okay, we have an idea what would be good for them, but why don't we just ask them? So we have about 20K authors on the platform, um, and I'm sure that they have their own struggles and own issues. Uh, we might not be able to solve everything, but at least we can actually you know, be more compassionate or just simply understand what's going on in their lives right now. And um, yeah, we basically sent out surveys to them, even on the platform, they could, you know, uh, not just rate our services everyone is doing uh, to have the net promoter score and all this kind of fancy stuff for investors. But we also asked, okay, what are the biggest challenges right now um, in your life throughout the whole pandemic? And um, that was actually eye opening. And it's, it was really interesting to see um, that, yes, we are a global platform. so. 
We have, you know, authors and, and publishers from over 100 countries. Most of them are in the States, but uh, we have everyone, you know, from every country, basically. We have someone from Trin Trinidad and Tobago or from the UK or from Australia, and everyone had different uh, issues. Somehow it was similar as well. So at least that's what we could say about the whole pandemic. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think that's that's important that we actually try to do that. We also um, organize webinars uh, where they can ask questions and um, also we can show them how the new functionalities are actually working on the platform. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think these are the main um, things that we try to make it more personal. Obviously, we have newsletter, we have all these kind of um, ways of engaging with everyone. But at the end of the day, um, if we can actually just stay in touch and um, at least with the retailers, we have, you know, twice a year, we just wrap up, okay, what's happening? What are the main strategic goals? How we can work together on a higher level? How we can actually help us, uh, help each other to grow further? Um, that that helps for us uh, to actually be on track and, and build the relationship and keep the relationship as well. So basically, that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds like you, you guys really upped your level of kind of this relationship management piece during the pandemic. I mean, obviously you're not able to go to these conferences, yeah. but you know, doing the webinars and really having that really close link to your customers. Um, and you had some great results from that too. Um, yeah. Do you want to share with us a little bit about kind of your growth during the past couple of years? Yeah, so basically last year, yes, I, I think um, that was something I already mentioned before that at the beginning of the pandemic, we had no idea what would happen. So we, Obviously thought that, okay, if more people will stay at home, then probably it will be good for business because more people will be reading uh, books and also more people will have time to actually write a book. Uh, so we had that kind of um, understanding what might happen. However, we were totally freaked out as everyone else because <laughs> we, we didn't know, okay, what, yeah. what kind of effect it will have on our employees, you know? Um, how will it actually go with the team? How can we work? totally remotely and then what if someone gets sick you know and all these kind of fears that came into the sure, picture yeah. and how we can be more um uh, a, a leader who is actually taking care of all these fears and all these issues at the same time so it was it was not easy i think but it was i'm, I'm sure for everyone else as well um and then uh, uh, yes, basically last year uh, we could see that the whole um, way of um, trying to deal with the crisis, I would say, um, we actually could grow about uh, more than 50%, so almost 60 And then this year, uh, by June, we almost double doubled compared to last year's growth as well. So it's, it's really, really a good path, I would say. And it shows that... Um, for, for instance, first of all, the whole market is actually growing as well, um, finally. <laughs> uh, but second of all, that uh, we actually are also doing something good uh, with the new formats, with also um, the relationship management that we try to build, um, and also with the new features that we are actually coming out with, because it's it shows that even during the pandemic, when everyone was cutting all the developments and just focusing on keeping whatever they had, we came out with new things with even, I, I would say, one of the biggest things that we had before. Um, and I think that was already a good sign for most of the um, clients that we had that, OK, these guys um, are taking themselves seriously, but also their clients. So they don't stop even the word is spinning and the word is totally crazy at the moment. So I think that was also a good me message. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your business model, because I think this mm -hmm. is also unique and part of the innovation in this space, because mm -hmm. you don't take any commission. Yes. So you just charge a subscription, yes. basically, to that's, your... That's how it, it works. Um, and it was also... So in the beginning, we were also commission-based, and then uh, we just understood that, okay, uh, the market is changing, and basically the clients we want to go after um, are looking for a uh, more reasonable way of working together. So they put a lot of effort into marketing and brand building and a lot of other ways, and they were just uh, 
looking to scale. And if we get, you know, part of their success all the time, then uh, it means that they cannot actually scale that much as they wanted. And uh, we thought that, okay, we do our part in terms of uh, dealing with all the uh, automated processes. And um, that actually costs something and uh, is valuable for the clients a lot. Uh, but we want to make sure that they can scale in a way that is um, good for them if they sell a lot too. So that's why we came up with this kind of subscription model where we don't take uh, additional commissions and we basically say that, okay, this is our platform, use however you want to, uh, for whatever stores you want to go to, for whatever functionalities, it's up to you. Uh, we give you all the guides and all the help if you need, um, but everything is in your hands and uh, just pay the subscription fee and uh, we try to um, make you su successful throughout the platform as, as, as much as possible. So that's, that's how it works. And when did you make that switch? Um, I think in uh, the second half of 2019. So it was... Um, before the pandemic, but not long before. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously when the pandemic happened, we were like, hmm, what will happen with the subscription? Whether people will pay for the subscription, because that's a different kind of business if you ask money upfront, instead of just, you know, living from uh, the commissions, which is basically zero, ri zero risk. Um, so that was also a question at the moment when the pandemic happened, whether it's still a good business model at this time, but it turned out that it's okay. <laughs> And how long do your users typically stay with you? Because I guess it, there's mm -hmm. a life cycle for, yes. for... Yeah, it's about 13 months. Uh, that's what we can see. So it's pretty good. Obviously, for the publishers, it's even more. Uh, so, um, But for authors, that's what we can see. So you have a different subscription for publishers? Yes. Yes, because um, usually the, um, publishers come to us and uh, they have hundreds or even thousands of books that they want to publish. And um, yeah, they need some kind of sales, um, you know, sales activity anyhow. So they have a, their own personal rep and um, that's usually how it goes. But they come from the same channels basically that authors are using. Uh, it's more like that they have a, a higher subscription plan they can come into. And the retailers and publish are they kind of in the same category or do you have another market segment that you're monetizing as well or mm. those are the main two mm -hmm. yeah it's basically for the retailers we work in a way that um it's it's more on the commission side so they they actually keep part of the commission and the rest of it will come to us what we actually will give back to the um end users mm -hmm. And this um, royalty management mm -hmm. tool, I guess that's more for the publishers, right? Or Yes, it... but even a lot of uh, authors who actually take themselves more seriously and they want to run a publishing business, mm -hmm. they start to, because the whole publishing business is about content. And obviously writing a book takes time. And um, well, we can see that if you have more books, then your sales will actually increase as well. And that's why a lot of like successful authors, they come up with um, this kind of growth plan that they start to collaborate with other authors and they co-write books, uh, which means that they can actually um, get content faster uh, written because um, they, if they work with someone else, then it's not just on themselves. And uh, this is a huge trend in the whole industry that co-authoring is actually becoming a big, tre big trend right now. Um, but there is no supporting way of, of dealing with financials, for instance. I've talked to a lot of co-authors um, and they said that they needed to open up a, a mutual bank account uh, <laughs> to deal with all the the business related stuff and I was like okay that sounds like a painful process and I don't think so that it's really worth it um, and then that's why we came up with the whole idea okay how we can actually make it uh, much more transparent and, and easier as well for the uh, co-authors and uh, yeah obviously they have less books to put into this kind of functionality however uh, it, the value is the same for them and they don't even have a 
financial team, uh, you know, it's it's good if they have an accountant who is looking at the financials at the end of the year. Uh, but they just wanted to make sure that if they are working with someone else, then they don't mess up with the financials because right. that's the main, you know, um, trustworthiness part of working together with someone else that you don't want to miss any payment or uh, you don't want to lose trust because you, you don't actually the screwed them over yeah. because you didn't calculate. Right? Yes. And <laughs> to be honest, a lot of artists, they are not finance people. Sure. So they are creatives. They can be messy and chaotic and wonderful people when it comes to creativity. So it's really fun to work with them. Uh, but yes, the business and administration side is not the strength of them. And, and it shouldn't be, I think. You also mentioned that um, you're doing, you have a lot of analytics that mm -hmm. you collect. And I think you started doing this during COVID as well, mm -hmm. publishing kind of a book report. Mm -hmm. um, what yeah. can you tell us about that? What are some of the big insights that you uncovered? Yeah, so that was uh, basically one of the biggest uh, like communication related uh, innovations, I would say, because the whole market is really um, not that transparent when it comes to sales numbers. And uh, we actually just wanted to make sure that at least the trends what we can uh, see, we can uh, communicate to the uh, authors and, and publishers as well. So if someone is thinking about, okay, what uh, language I should actually publish uh, my book, um, maybe I can translate into a new language, then they know, okay, whether it's the time to do that or not. And um, well, we could definitely see that uh, during the whole COVID, whenever there was a quarantine in one of the countries or a big spike of the cases, um, then the book sales numbers were following that route. So whenever like whole Italy was closed down, then you could see that, OK, the book sales numbers in Italy just grew a lot and even in France and then Spain. So it was really interesting to follow that kind of route. Um, but what we also saw that um, the content, what people were reading was a bit different. So uh, more nonfiction related titles were selling than before. Oh, interesting. Yes. Uh, and it's probably because a lot of people were uh, traveling before, you know, and taking a lot of business trips. And then those were just canceled. So um, they were staying at home and then uh, they were thinking about, OK, what should I do? Probably I should uh, educate myself in some other way, uh, read something that would be, you know, not just fun to read, but also give some kind of knowledge and extra skill set. So we could definitely see that nonfiction related titles, especially when it comes to education, um, then it was really growing. Um, and on the other hand, we could see that uh, how the t time passed, uh, more people were turning into psychology related books as well. Mental uh, health support. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And we can understand that why. Sure. <laughs> so more and also family and relationships and just understand, OK, how they can deal with all the issues that they probably have at home because they have to stay at home and, and deal, ev deal with everything. Um, so I think that was also showing that, OK, people are getting fed up with this whole COVID thing, which is totally understandable. And um, then uh, we also could see that uh, when it comes to the retailer side of the business, um, a lot of subscription related models uh, and platforms were spiking throughout the whole COVID. Um, also, because we work with digital libraries uh, as well, uh, and many of them obviously have their uh, physical library too. Um, but as the libraries were closed down too, they were actually focusing on the digital. So the digital libraries uh, sales, they were growing Ex really re significantly basically throughout the whole COVID as well. What does that mean? So they were buying books to put on their library? Or yes. Okay. So basically like schools, universities, um, everything was basically converting close. to ebooks. Yeah. So yeah, yeah they had converting to converting to digital mm -hmm. because before they had the print versions as well. Uh, and now they were, okay, we cannot do anything uh, with print right now because no one is going to the library. So they, they needed to deal with the digital side of the things, which was, um, also really interesting to see and then uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to the regional stores, so we could see that um, retail in general was really going up and, and it was really strong throughout the COVID. Uh, but we could see that some of the regions uh, were actually performing even better. So we have a, a partly Singapore and a US based partner, for instance, and their sales were skyrocketing throughout the COVID. Um, and I think that's, that's also a good sign um, that there is a word outside of, you know, Amazon and the big players, but um, there is a lot of other sales that you can miss if you don't go to different markets and different um, options that is available for you, for the readers to sell books and read books. Hmm. Um, Why do you think there was a big spike in the US and Singapore and, and those partners? I think uh, because they had a good niche uh, that they were focusing on uh, in terms of readers and they just did a good marketing strategy and probably the whole COVID was just helping that because more people were staying at home. And um, yeah, I think that was one of the main reasons. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting that you see kind of what categories, so what genres yeah. people are reading. It's a really good glimpse of kind of the zeitgeist of the times, like, yeah. you know, yeah, and this, you know, starting with nonfiction and then moving more to the self-help bathing relationship. Yeah, I would have thought, you know, fiction actually would be popular too, just because, you know, yeah. you want to escape from the reality. So just- Yeah, fiction, yeah, fiction is always popular. So that was also popular. It was just interesting to see the trend that nonfiction was selling more than before in terms of uh, sales numbers. But yes, yeah. uh, fiction was also really uh, popular. Uh, especially yeah, throughout the last years, like uh, fantasy and rom romance is always obviously <laughs> a big thing. Uh, but we could also see, uh, for instance, erotica related books because people were staying at home. They probably couldn't go to Tinder dates yeah. anymore that much. You got to get uh, your fix somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think it, what, it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of the impacts of COVID, you know, were really played out in in the book industry yes. because yeah like all these things you know you, mm -hmm. you with relationships and in skilling up you know i think a lot of people are trying to educate yeah. themselves so yeah that's that makes a lot of sense um and it's great you guys were there to kind of capitalize on that mm -hmm. and you had your new products all, all lined up right before um you mentioned um earlier kind of in your journey that you know you had to kind of hustle and you're always stalking mm -hmm. the big players at conferences and stuff like that can you tell us about one big name that you got on board finally that was like, okay, you know, we've made it, or maybe there's a story that you have you could share? Yeah, so um, when uh, we started out, um, we really wanted to get on the list of Apple uh, approved aggregators. So it's basically a preferred partner list um, and only a few companies globally are there. And uh, for that, obviously, we knew that it will not happen just overnight um, and we needed to have a relationship. And also we thought that, OK, there will be probably a due diligence process about that. Um, but for that, we needed to find the right person to talk to. And uh, yes, that was basically, I think, the big biggest one of the biggest wins in terms of that, because, uh, yeah, we went to the Frankfurt Book Fair. And uh, before that, I was really just living on LinkedIn, basically, and trying <laughs> to find the right person. And um, I was really uh, happy because I could actually, and fortunate because I could find a lady who is in Germany, um, who was in Germany at that time, because probably right now she's in the UK already um, and uh, yeah she her name was Nicole and uh, yes she was agreeing to meet us and uh, that's when we started to uh, have a relationship with Apple because she could see that okay we do something good uh, we are also trustworthy because to be honest uh, we started to do that uh, kind of hustling uh, you know, finding the right people and, and engaging them, it was not easy. They just saw some weird names uh, <laughs> in their inbox. And then um, when we met in person, they were like, okay, they are just, you know, a few young people from, a weird, real. Yeah. Yeah, from a weird country with a weird <laughs> accent. And um, 
what should they do? What, what, why would I do business with them? So it was not easy to build that kind of um, relationship uh, that they can trust us. And yeah, Nicole, for instance, from Apple, uh, she was working at the content side at that part on the DAC region mostly. Um, but um, she was open to actually help us. And basically with her help, uh, we could get into the process of becoming an Apple, aggre uh, Apple approved aggregator. Uh, however, um, it was, you know, before that I had to provide a plans, what we will actually uh, have in the future, um, whether we, you know, what kind of content we will bring on board and so on. And then after we delivered on the plan, so that's important, mm -hmm. then that's what, that was the part when they took us seriously. And then they started the due, due diligence process. So they looked at the platform, they talked to a few customers of ours, and then, yeah, basically we had calls with uh, different people from the U.S., um, on the management level and then when they saw that okay we actually could be good to go then we uh, got on the list of Apple approved aggregators which is um, still valid today and still a few companies are there so it's a really big achievement for us. Wow so okay so you did some LinkedIn stalking you finally met Nicole at this Frankfurt book fair when was this? I think in 2015 maybe or yes. Okay so still pretty early. In yes. Your, in, okay and then when did you finally make it onto this list? I think a few months after that. So okay, so it was pretty it was quick. Yeah. Quick, quick, yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, about six months after that. Yes. So, and basically since then, for the yes. last five years, yes. you've been still there. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. That's really, that's a nice example of, you know, just hustling and sticking <laughs> with it. And yeah, you can get there. Awesome. Um, okay, let's talk about fundraising a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you started Publish Drive in 2015. When did you take on your first financing round? So we basically, when we launched, we were taking part in an accelerator program in Estonia, in Tallinn, which was called Startup Wise Guys. And um, basically they gave us uh, like a pre-seed or pre-pre-seed uh, money, <laughs> uh, I would say. And um, also they uh, gave us a follow-up investment as well. Um, that was the first time, basically. And uh, it was really good for us to actually be there uh, because at the very first moment, we wanted to be a global company. So we thought that, okay, um, it's really good to start from Hungary, but we definitely want to have an international customer base because that's the value what we actually have in our DNA to work with global customers, but also um, to work with partners like Apple and Google. Obviously, they are coming from other countries too. Um, and when we launched, um, there were a lot of mentors there in the Startup Wise Guys program who could actually help us um, to figure out all the uh, business related stuff and also help us in uh, B2B sales and, um, you know, putting together pitch decks and those kind of things, which was really helpful. Um, and also to meet other um, startups who were actually coming from different countries. And we are still good friends with uh, uh, many of them, which is also a really big part of these kind of pro programs, I think, because obviously most of us will go through the same problems in some kind of different way, but at least uh, we can share those experiences. And um, yeah, that was the first one. And then uh, we- How much did they put in altogether? It was really a small amount. So I think it was uh, all in all, it was 150K, I think. Um, and then when uh, we went to uh, the Google Accelerator program in uh, San Francisco in 2017, um, that was also a big jump for us because before that we were only a, a Hungarian company. Although we had, uh, many US based customers already and even a lot of authors were trying to uh, work with us and we, we could do that with many of them however um, because we were a Hungarian company we couldn't we couldn't actually take on board um, a private person who doesn't have at least you know um, some kind of sole proprietor uh, legal uh, status um, and then uh, we actually got into this program with uh, Google and that's where we could get to know better a bit how the whole US market works. We had a lot of mentors there. Um, 
we still mm, work with a few of them um, today, which is really good. And uh, that was actually something that opened our eyes. Okay, we probably need to change our legal um, ecosystem a bit, especially when it comes to copyrights and we work with copyrighted works. Um, Hungary is not the best example from a legal perspective because, you know, um, it's not illegal to download, uh, for instance, pirated content. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a big issue. Meanwhile, in the US, it works totally differently. So we knew that if we want to actually scale on a global level, we have to have uh, a legal environment, which is actually good for our clients. So that's, that was um, the part when we decided, okay, we need to come up with uh, a plan how we become a, a U.S. company. Uh, but for that, we also needed money um, to actually expand the team and also to um, step into the U.S. market a bit more. And um, yes, that's after the whole program, we actually got our uh, seed funding, um, which was, I think, 1 million euros at that time. So yeah, um, that was it. And that's how we worked uh, still today. So we haven't raised more money yet. And you and you created a US entity yes. for that f financing round? Yes. So and from today on, uh, it's basically uh, the headquarters is in the US and uh, the US company, which is an INC, is uh, the 100 percent owner of the Hungarian entity. So that was the main structure that um, we wanted to be totally transparent. So because there, there is a lot of ways how you can do that. You can set up just, you know, um, companies who work together, but they are not um, legally um, the same. But we wanted to actually have it in the in the right way to make sure that in the future we can actually have a much cleaner structure. And um, was it Google Launchpad that that did the yes. investment? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because they're not doing investments anymore. No, no, right? not the investment. No, no, sorry, Google Launchpad was, was the, the program. program yeah. Yes, and the investment was Credo. Got it. Okay, that's right. Um, and you have not taken on, you have no plans to, for further financing at this point, or how do you feel? Mm, we might have. <laughs> we'll you might see. not. You yeah. heard it here, Publish Drive. <laughs> Get it while it's hot, VCs, if you're listening. <laughs> um, yeah, that's impressive, though. I mean, you know, you've been able to really do a lot with mm -hmm. very small investment and, you know, 20 person team. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, congratulations. Like that's, it's really impressive. Everything that you guys have been able to do, especially in the last couple of years with COVID and everything, it seems like you're really hitting the stride. Um, so yeah, what would you say, I guess we talked about some of your challenges mm -hmm. along the way, um, although you make it sound easy <laughs> in <laughs> retrospect, but what would you say was, the biggest kind of unexpected thing that you had to tackle as a CEO, um, you know, running the business? Well, I don't want to just uh, say COVID because that would, <laughs> that would be too easy, I would say. <laughs> um, there were many, many unexpected things uh, that happened um, that was actually um, a barrier for our scaling, for instance. So, um, yeah, we had this kind of issue um, before we actually become uh, a U.S. entity that um, from a financial perspective, because we are actually paying out money as well. Uh, we couldn't actually scale that part of the business and um, because we were a Hungarian entity. And yeah, I don't want to get into too much details of that. Uh, but when we come up with uh, the U.S. entity, we had to research, OK, how we can make it uh, scalable in a way um, that is legally and also from a taxation perspective um, is OK for the IRS, which mm -hmm. is the U.S. NOV, uh, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Tax authority. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that was a bit uh, challenging i would say because um it can be really expensive and you can also mess it up really badly which will probably end up in <clears throat> making your company bankrupt so i think that was one of the biggest uh, challenges in terms of scaling how mm -hmm. we can make it happen in a way that is is still um you know valid for the whole business um but also we are legally um covered from all aspects and i think we did a good job in that um 
but that was a long process. So it wasn't happening overnight. And to deal with all these kind of different stakeholders in that front too, um, and then make that whole process uh, work, I think that was not easy. But also we had um, a lot of, you know, issues with changes in some of the partners we work with, um, how they change their whole uh, operations or their whole uh, business in general, and then how to negotiate those kind of um, situations. Um, also, when, you know, for instance, um, the COVID happened and some of the Chinese partners, they just disappeared because, mm -hmm. yes, COVID in China, you, you all know what what it means <laughs> and then um, yeah I don't like when everyone is trying to uh, cover up uh, with uh, the COVID thing that yeah I couldn't actually do that because of the COVID because uh, I think that's um, that's valid for everyone right now right. so everyone is suffering from the same things but yeah basically how to how to still uh, keep the relationship go um, and also how we can deal with um, that kind of partnership on a higher level uh, so they actually can manage all the operational related issues as well and then get all the money that we needed to get from them. So that was not easy at that time because they just went black, basically. Mm -hmm. But then we, we could figure that out. And I think uh, that was also a big um, issue when I had to jump in as a CEO and, and support the team because obviously it wasn't me who was handling this whole thing, but then it was escalated to me. So mm -hmm, all these mm -hmm. kind of things with, where I can support the team to make something happen, um, I think that's a, a big challenge to actually deal with. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the team. Mm -hmm. um, so you have about 20 people. How do you, how, what's the structure? Yeah, so we have um, most of the um, like coders and, and developers in Hungary, and then we have uh, the sales and uh, marketing mostly in, in the US. And um, yes, basically that's the main structure, the main idea. And um, we have some, you know, operations related team as well in terms of um, the whole support team and uh, how the product operations is working. And then we have, you know, all the back office related stuff, like, you know, everything that relates to finance and um, all these kind of things that uh, you don't want to deal with, but you have to. And how many salespeople are there? Uh, currently one only in uh, for inbound sales. In the U.S.? Yeah. And then are they all in the same place or is everybody distributed? I guess you're uh, a remote company. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are remote, so we are not really focusing uh, on just to have, you know, physical um, presence, which is actually uh, something that we had before, before the whole COVID thing. Um, then our, um, you know, contract with the office expired. And when this, we decided, okay, we don't know what to do, actually, how the whole COVID thing will happen in the future. So we decided to uh, stay remote for a while. And then when everything is becoming more um, reliable, then we will probably have a new office. And in the meantime, we just go into, um, you know, we book some spaces where we can actually meet uh, more, more of us, meeting rooms and so on in, in co-working spaces uh, where we can work together if it is needed. And um, I think that's also something that we have to figure out in the future, how we deal with um, the whole remote working and the whole um, physical presence as well, because we can see that the team really wants to meet as well, but they also don't want to give up the remote work either. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's totally understandable. And to be honest, I'm the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to reinvent how we actually are working together when we meet in person, because I think that's not really working anymore that if we meet, everyone is on the computer on their own and that's all. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need an office for that right. because we have our homes for that already. So that's something that that is really, um, you know, making me think about how we will work in the future together, yeah. uh, which will actually be more efficient for the whole company. Do you get everybody together, even in the U.S.? We try to do that, yes, if it is possible. And yeah, during the COVID, we had, um, you know, um, um, online remote Christmas party and uh -huh. these kind of things. <laughs> so even if it is not always possible to be 
present in physical as well for everyone. We try to do that at least in a hybrid way. And are you um, are you hiring? Is there anybody you're looking to expand the team? Yes, we we would be happy to have uh, more people, especially on the sales and marketing side. So um, if anyone is <laughs> interested in the publishing area or have good connections, you, you are welcome. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I have one last question, I think, and then we can wrap up for today. Um, yeah, you you are pretty active. You know, I think it's great you have this example of your mom, you know, to be inspiring. And there's so many women out there mm -hmm. who maybe don't have this or don't believe it's possible. And it's so great to have you also in the ecosystem just kind of blazing this trail. What advice would you have for aspiring founders, especially female founders? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what message do you want to leave them with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really good um, because I actually am involved with a lot of you know female uh, founders related even studies, but also groups and work groups as well. So I was taking part in the Google program, um, which was for female founders, which was super super helpful um, because it was during the COVID, and I think all of us needed extra support as mm -hmm. well from each other. Um, and I think in general, women are less good in in the networking part somehow. So I'm really happy that in I could be part of a few of these groups where we can support each, each other. And then also um, during the COVID, I was taking part in a study uh, which was uh, researching um, how female founders are actually funded in the region, in the CE region. It was started by a Polish VC, um, Experia Venture Fund. Um, and um, I think that was really eye-opening in general because um, it turned out that only 1% uh, of the female founders who are only female founders receiving the funds um, in general. Meanwhile, 5% uh, who are mixed teams, like us, for instance, uh, receive funds mm -hmm. as well. Um, and all the rest, like 94% will go for, for guys, which is interesting because I'm sure that there are more companies who are actually uh, founded or led by women uh, in that proportion. So yeah, we have a lot of things to do in that front still. But um, I think we are also evolving. So um, probably 10 years ago, it was even worse. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure that there is a pro positive trend. So for women, I would definitely just say what um, one of the angel investors told me as well in the Silicon Valley that um, I should get prepared for that, that um, because I'm a woman, um, I will be more challenged by investors and by uh, business partners and so on uh, than a guy would be. And it's not something that you can change instantly. Um, but you shouldn't be worried about that. So just get prepared and uh, make sure that you you know everything about your business, um, the last tiny details as well. Uh, make sure you go out and, and you know meet people and don't be afraid to ask for things because I think that's also a, a weak point of women that you, uh, many of us just don't like to ask for things. And I'm not sure why exactly because uh, that's what I always say that um, even though if you just ask for something, the worst thing that can happen that you receive a yes, right? Mm -hmm. Because the no <laughs> is already in your pocket. So right. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I think more women should be outspoken and, and just go um, and, and say the thing you want. And in the worst case scenario, nothing happens. And I think we can live with that too. So um, I think these are the two main points, I would say, based on my experiences that... Um, Yes, um, there will be challenges, uh, even more challenges as well for women than men uh, that you have to deal with. And just don't try to make it too seriously. Uh, it's, it's more of just focus on yourself and try to be as good as possible without any uh, further fears. And the second one, as I mentioned, ask for help if needed, uh, because you can actually be surprised how many people will say yes. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kinga. This was so much fun. Um, and best of luck to you and Publish Drive. We're excited to follow your progress uh, in the years to come. So take care. Thank you for inviting. Bye. 
Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when we release new episodes. Tune in next time as we continue to deep dive and uncover more hidden gems in the Untold Stories podcast. Check out our show notes for more resources about the topics we discuss and anything we mentioned during the podcast. Let us know what was your key takeaway from today's episode. And if you found this content useful, please feel free to share it with anyone else you think would benefit from it.